Friday night, a remote country road outside the city of Texarkana. I don't want to kill you, fellow, so do what I say, said the man brandishing a gun. He wore a white pillowcase with eye slits cut into it. 24-year-old Jimmy Hollis stared at the man in disbelief. His date, 19-year-old Mary Jean LeRae, clutched Jimmy's arm in terror. The man pointed the gun, ready to fire. Jimmy and Mary Jean followed orders and got out of the car. The city of Texarkana is half in Texas and half in Arkansas. In the 1940s, the city was an odd mix of rural and urban, quiet and bustling. The general mood of the city was peaceful, confident. World War II was over and America was getting back to normal. No one was prepared for the events that occurred during the spring of 1946. The evening began with a double date, Jimmy and Mary Jean and Jimmy's brother Bob and his girlfriend. The four of them went to the Strand Theater in downtown Texarkana to see a monster movie, The House of Dracula. After the movie, the couples went their separate ways. Jimmy drove his father's Plymouth to Richmond Road, a remote country road about a mile outside the city. The area was popular with locals as a lover's lane. Jimmy and Mary Jean were canoodling when a bright flashlight suddenly shone on them. A creepy stranger in a pillowcase mask armed with a gun demanded that they get out of the car. After a few seconds, they realized this wasn't a prank, so they obeyed him. The masked man then snarled at Jimmy to take off his britches. At first, Jimmy refused, but Mary Jean urged him to comply. Jimmy removed his slacks and stood awkwardly in his boxers. The gunman suddenly slammed his pistol twice into Jimmy's head. A loud cracking sound rang through the air. Mary Jean thought Jimmy had been shot. Later, she would learn that the sound was his skull cracking. The gunman ended up letting Mary Jean go, but then chased her down the street and hit her with the flashlight. When finally he went back toward Jimmy, Mary Jean bolted. She ran about half a mile until she reached a house. She hammered on the door, screaming for help. Thankfully, the residents woke up and called for help. First to arrive at the crime scene was Bowie County Sheriff W.H. Presley and three Texarkana patrolmen. The gunman was long gone. Both victims were transported to Texarkana Hospital. Jimmy was in critical condition. He ended up being diagnosed with multiple skull fractures. He would spend the next three months receiving treatment for his injuries. Mary Jean was released the next day after receiving stitches for a scalp wound. However, she was deeply traumatized, suffered nightmares, and would ultimately leave the state to live with relatives in Oklahoma. Both Jimmy and Mary Jean were questioned by the police, and their stories were generally consistent except for one detail. Jimmy described their attacker as a six-foot, tanned white male under 30, while Mary Jean claimed he was a light-skinned black man. The police had no motives and no suspects, although one published report claims that six people were arrested and released after questioning. This was the first crime, but it wouldn't be the last. March 24, 1946, a rainy Sunday morning, a remote country road outside the city of Texarkana. Around 8.30 a.m., a motorist passed a 1941 Oldsmobile sedan parked beside Rich Road and saw two figures inside who looked like they were asleep. Concerned, he stopped and got out to investigate. He quickly realized the two people weren't asleep. They were dead, slumped in pools of blood. He got back in his car and raced to town where he alerted the city police. The police called Sheriff Presley since the car was parked on county turf, roughly a mile outside city limits. Sheriff Presley, along with Jackson Runnels, chief of police on the Texas side of Texarkana, were first on the scene. They found a man and a woman posed in the back of an Oldsmobile. The man knelt in front of the back seat, his forehead resting on crossed hands which lay on the back seat. The woman was sprawled face down on the back seat. Both victims were fully clothed. Both had been been shot in the back of the head with a 32 caliber pistol. Despite the rain, there were huge blood stains on the ground, about 20 feet away from the car. The lack of a gun at the scene ruled out murder-suicide. The blood-stained dirt suggested that the couple had been slain outside then returned to the car. The victims were soon identified as 29-year-old Richard Griffin and his girlfriend 17-year-old Pollyanne Moore. Texarkana's two mayors pressed for the crime to be solved quickly. Sheriff Presley and Police Chief Runnels immediately launched a full-scale investigation, collaborating with Arkansas side police Chief Richard Giles, the Miller County Sheriff, the Arkansas State Police, and the Texas Department of Public Safety. A Texas Ranger also came to assist in the investigation. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot to go on. Rain and then morbid locals who came to view the crime scene obliterated any potential evidence. By the end of March, the authorities had questioned some 50 witnesses. The couple had been seen dining at a cafe around 10 p.m. with Griffin's sister Eleanor and her boyfriend the night before, but the authorities couldn't account for their time after that. Though the police didn't notice a connection between the Hollis the Ray attack on February 22nd and the Griffin Moore murder on March 24th, some uneasy locals did. However, hysteria had not gripped the city yet. April
April 14, 1946, Palm Sunday, a remote country road northeast of Texarkana in Nevada County, Arkansas. At 6 a.m., the Weaver family was driving on North Park Road when they spotted a man's body lying on the north shoulder. They quickly drove to the nearest house to call for help. The victim was soon identified as 17-year-old Jimmy Martin of Kilgore, Texas, a town about 105 miles away from Texarkana. Jimmy had been shot four times. Investigators soon discovered that Jimmy had been in town visiting friends. The night before, he had a date with 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker. He arranged to pick her up after a dance at the local Veterans of Foreign Wars, or VFW, hall. Betty Jo played saxophone at the dance with a local band, the Rhythm Airs. Friends saw the couple leave together. Authorities confirmed that Betty Jo had never made it home. A search started with the local volunteers helping out. Around noon, three friends of Betty Jo found the missing girl's body behind a tree near crossroads about one and three quarters miles from Jimmy's death scene. She'd been shot twice. Jimmy's missing Ford Club Coupe, which had the key in the ignition, was found near the entrance to Spring Lake Park, about one and a quarter miles away from his body and three miles away from Betty Jo's body. Jimmy and Betty Jo had last been seen alive at 2 a.m. on Sunday as they left the VFW Hall. They planned to visit Spring Lake Park, another popular lover's lane. A resident living near Betty Jo's crime scene reported hearing a gunshot around 5.30 a.m. The police found 32 caliber shells and a couple of slugs around Jimmy's car. The FBI joined the investigation as well as more Texas Rangers. FBI ballistics tests would reveal that the shells had microscopic markings matching the weapons used to kill Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. Several fingerprints were collected from the car that didn't belong to Jimmy or Betty Jo. The fingerprints were compared to FBI and local files, but no matches were made. For the third time, authorities had little to go on. A second double murder and the fact that it occurred quickly after the first shocked the town. The death of Betty Jo, well-known and well-liked, horrified local teens. The nightlife of Texarkana slowed to a crawl. Families set early curfews for their teens and barricaded themselves in their homes. Hardware stores sold out of deadbolt locks, guns, and ammo. Reporters from newspapers around the world descended upon Texarkana. On April 16th, hoping to outsell the competition, the Texarkana Daily News named the city's serial gunman the Phantom Killer. The name caught on and everyone began using it. Since the start, there had been some power struggles between the different law enforcement agencies over information and the best way to proceed with the investigations. The second double murder further intensified pressure on the authorities. They conducted patrols and even had decoys park on lovers' lanes, hoping to catch the killer in the act. But the phantom never showed. Some 300 persons were detained for questioning, ex-cons, drifters, those with reputations. However, no one could be linked to the crimes. Local groups pledged money to be used as rewards for tips, leading authorities to apprehend the killer. By April 20th, reward money totaling $4,280, or some $60,200 in today's money, had been promised. Tips poured in, but they led nowhere. May 3, 1946 Friday evening, the Starks Farm about 10 miles northeast of Texarkana. After a hard day's work, 37-year-old Virgil Starks relaxed in his living room armchair with a heating pad tucked behind him to soothe his aching back. He listened to the radio as he read the Texarkana Gazette. His wife, 36-year-old Katie Sarks, who had already dressed for bed in a nightgown, lay on the bed in an adjacent room. She suddenly heard a noise and yelled for Virgil to turn down the radio. Then she heard the sound of breaking glass. Thinking that Virgil had dropped something, Katie went to the living room. As she reached the doorway, she saw that Virgil was standing. Suddenly, he slumped back into his chair. Katie raced over to her husband and lifted his head. Blood spilled onto her fingers. Virgil had been shot twice through a window behind him by a gunman standing on the front porch of the Starks' farmhouse. Katie had not seen the shooter or heard gunfire. She ran into the kitchen to call for help. The Starks had an old hand crank telephone mounted on the kitchen wall. Katie lifted the receiver, cranked the handle twice, then staggered back as two bullets slammed into the left side of her face. Several of her teeth shattered and went skittering across the kitchen floor. Dazed, Katie dropped to her hands and knees. The gunman hammered on a kitchen window trying to get into the house. Katie pushed past her pain, got to her feet, and stumbled through the house to make it out the front door. From there, Katie, barefoot, wearing a blood-soaked nightgown, ran across Highway 67 to a nearby house of her sister and brother-in-law, but they weren't home. So Katie ran another 50 yards to the next house. A few neighbors transported the bleeding, semi-conscious Katie to Michael Meeker Memorial Hospital, where she immediately went into surgery. One bullet had pierced Katie's cheek and exited behind her ear. Doctors found another bullet wedged under her tongue. Katie survived her injuries but hadn't seen the gunman and couldn't describe him to police. As soon as they received word of the crime, the police, sheriff, and Texas Rangers quickly descended on the Starks' farmhouse to collect evidence, dust for prints, and take pictures. The gunman had clearly gotten in. His footprints were on the linoleum. Katie had left the trail of blood and teeth during her mad dash to escape. When Virgil was shot, his heating pad had shorted out and burst into flames, scorching his chair. It was still smoldering. However, Virgil's corpse wasn't burned because because it had fallen to the floor. Disturbingly, investigators found a few bloody handprints, suggesting that the killer had deliberately
secretly dipped his hand in Virgil's blood and creepily decorated the wall. No robbery occurred, cash and Katie's jewelry were left untouched. As law enforcement combed through the evidence, some came to the conclusion that the Stark slaying had been committed by a different criminal. The first three crimes had happened on the Texas side of town, while the Starks lived in Arkansas. A 22 instead of a 32 was used, and the killer had changed his MO. Some claimed it was a copycat killing. Also, there were rumors that Virgil had an affair with one of his relatives' wives, and the shooting was revenge. As can be imagined, the latest slaying whipped Texarkana into a frenzy. Rumors spread, altercations, fights, and shootings rose in the area. Residents' tempers were hair triggered. Police spent a lot of time investigating tips that led nowhere as people made accusations against anyone they disliked or considered weird. Arkansas State Policeman Max Tackett realized that every time the killer phantom struck, a car had been stolen and then later abandoned. Weeks after the Starks' attack, the Texarkana police located a car stolen the same night as the Martin Booker murders. On Friday, June 28, policeman Tackett staked out the stolen car until someone came back to it. That person turned out to be 21-year-old Peggy Swinney. When arrested in question, Peggy revealed that she was a newlywed. Earlier in the day, she had married Ewell Swinney, who had a history of counterfeiting and car theft. Her husband was currently some 25 miles away in Atlanta, Texas, trying to sell another stolen car. The couple had a stormy, violent relationship and had gone on a cross-country spree of stealing cars and picking up hitchhikers. Within a few days, the police had tracked down Ewell and arrested him for car theft. While being arrested, Ewell made some curious and possibly incriminating statements that suggested he was a murderer. During another interview with Peggy, the police lied, saying that they were holding Ewell for murder. Peggy then confessed that her husband was the phantom killer and offered several details about the Martin Booker murders. Police were able to independently verify some of her details, however, Ewell's fingerprints didn't match the prints found at any of the scenes. Peggy's stories kept changing across several more interviews. Police believe she was withholding some facts due to fear of incriminating herself. Eventually, Peggy recanted her original confession. Because she was an unreliable witness and they only had circumstantial evidence, the police couldn't arrest Ewell for murder. Also, by law in 1946, Peggy could not be forced to testify against her husband. But the police could and did charge Ewell with violation of his 1945 parole. Also, he was charged with a third felony for his recent car theft. Ewell was found guilty and on April 18, 1947, sent back to jail for life as a habitual offender. Meanwhile, for most of the summer of 1946, the city of Texarkana remained on high alert and the authorities continued to investigate. Old police files include a list of 1,047 persons of interest that were investigated in the months after the Starks attack. Eventually, as there were no further attacks, outside law enforcement as well as the media slowly withdrew. The public relaxed their vigilance. The phantom killer never struck again. Over the next couple of years, a few people involved with the cases would be sent anonymous letters claiming that the wrong man was fingered and the real murderer was still out there. The letters dropped hints, but it's not known if police ever followed up on the leads. After the Supreme Court made judgments in the 1960s which altered the legal rights of criminal defendants, Ewell and thousands of other conflicts disputed their prior convictions. Ewell challenged the court saying that his sentence should have been no longer than 10 years and he shouldn't have received the habitual offender charge. Ultimately, after serving 26 years, in 1973, a judge granted Ewell writ of habeas corpus and ordered his release. Sadly, Ewell went back to his criminal ways and was in and out of jail for the next 20 years. He only stopped committing crimes after suffering a stroke. In 1993, a writer researching a book about the phantom killer tracked down Ewell Swinney at a Dallas nursing home. Ewell bragged about some of his crimes but angrily denied being the phantom or having anything to do with the murders. He died the next year at age 77. The phantom killer murders are still considered unsolved. Do we finally know the identity of the Zodiac Killer? Was Jack the Ripper part of the royal family?